have an interview with a very ordinary Christian. And uh, many of you know uh, Dr. Michael Lee. And we're going to use a series of maps to sort of narrate a life and uh, kind of get from point A to point B to C to D and all the rest. So um, let me introduce to you. This is Dr. Michael Lee. How long have you been at Grace Bible Church? About three years. And how long have you been on the earth? 49 years. Okay. 49 is really old, by the way. <laughs> Anything above 48 is ancient. That's what my kids tell me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, let's get started. First slide tells us where things began. So, uh, Michael Lee, tell us where you were and what you were doing there. So, I was born in a small town called Taishan. It's a really interesting town because most of the original Chinese immigrants to the U.S. were from that area. So if you think about 1800s, late 1800s with the construction of the rail, railways in California especially, so most of the Chinese laborers came from that area of China. And primarily because we were so poor and so desperate that we were the only people who were willing to leave um, at least my ancestors were willing to leave China and risk dying in a foreign land and then having the souls never return back home. So that's uh, where I was born uh, in 1974. Um, and so 1974, just as some background, was the tail end of the Cultural Revolution. So as you know, uh, the communists took over China in 1949 my father was born in 1948, my mom born in 1949. So they lived through the, the horrors of the first 20 years of communist China. My grandfather in 1958 or 59 uh, died as one of 40 million people during the Great Famine in China as, um, as a result of failed uh, political and economic uh, policies that led to um, a dramatic drop in agricultural production and just mass famine across China. Okay, Mike, I want to ask you about communism. There's a danger here because we could spend hours on this topic. And so I'm watching the clock. I'm going to interrupt you. I'll be rude because we need to get to better things than communism. But yep. from your vantage point, the effect on your family, mm. what you saw in China, um, what are your impressions of communism as an ideology? Nothing good. I know there's a resurgence of interest in socialism, communism, but for those who really understand the, the roots of communism, you think about Marx and Engel, there, there was not truly an economic uh, theory. It was, it was a philosophy that is anti-God, right? You, you know, for some of you who has read, especially Marx's writing about the critique of religion, um, his famous saying that religion is the, um, the opium of the people, but it is really an attack on God. It is really an attack on man being made in the image of God. And I think that is the beginning of communism. The effort to make uh, or to create utopia in this world would never succeed because communists or socialists don't understand human nature. We are sinners. There would never be utopia in this world. And for people who argue, well, you know, US, USSR and China, they were not really communists. No, they were real communists. And we see the death of easily over 100 million people in the former Soviet Union, China, Cambodia, Vietnam, you name it. Mike, one of the great tools uh, that Marx laid out and then all of, the, all of the governments that tried out his ideology, one of the great tools was the use of a lie. And, and the lie was built not so much to convince people against the truth, but actually to make the people swallow the lie. In other words, to get the population to know that they were being lied to and yet agree to it by coercion. If you could get them to agree to what they knew was a lie, you had absolute totalitarian control. Just as a, a social experiment, um, it was successful. Uh, you've talked with me before about um, just the, the weight of propaganda, 
the, the nature of the lie, how you saw that play out in your own home growing up? Well, we know the father of lies is Satan. And so there's no different in communist ideologies that I would say that the communists and socialists are really in the hands of Satan for the destruction of man. Um, I think maybe a, a different way to answer that question is um, in a socialist, quote unquote, egalitarian society, who is really in control? Um, I can tell you in China, it was not egalitarian. Uh, there's some people who are more equal than others. And starting with Chairman Mao, and Chairman Mao is, um, is a form of religion cloaked in um, this equality ideology. I remember even toward the end of the Cultural Revolution in, um, I attended two years of elementary school in China in a small uh, village um, school. And in the front of every classroom is a picture of Mao. And every day, every morning, we attend uh, school. And the first thing we do is pledge allegiance, not to the country, not to the party, but to him. And we sing songs to praise him and to worship him. And so, so the propaganda is not just for loyalty to a country, but the propaganda is to have people worship a man. And I think that is the biggest lie that Satan has against, um, he, I would say, humanity, that you don't need to worship God. You can worship man. You can even worship God's creation. And so I think the biggest, in terms of propaganda, the ultimate goal of communist propaganda, at least in China, is the worship of a man. What about the traditional religions of China? How did they fare up against the communist revolution and the worship of Mao? I think that's a really interesting point. Um, you know, China for countless generations have been um, practicing Confucianism, Buddhism, Taoism, a lot of other indigenous worships, ancestor worship, um, spirit worship, and so imagine 1949, communists take over and they're trying to eradicate the history of China, essentially, by eliminating all kind of worship. And you can only be loyal, you can only worship one man. It's hard to do. I think, at least what I witnessed, was while there was public proclamation um, of loyalty and worship to this one man, Underneath all of that, I think man is created to, to hunger for God or to hunger for something beyond this world. And so people still continue to practice the indigenous belief and, and worship um, you know, um, traditions, but just underneath all of that. And so that's how I grew up. So on one hand, yes, we, you know, we quote unquote worship Mao, but on the other hand, we would still burn incense. We would offer sacrifices to our ancestors. We would pray to the kitchen god, the god of wealth, the god of health, the god of agriculture. Um, and so that is a really interesting mix that while communists and the socialists try to remove that from, from, you know, from practice, but man by nature is always seeking something to worship that's beyond this world. If you get a chance to ask Mike about the traditions in China, religious traditions that go back farther than Confucianism or Taoism, um, you should ask him about the pictograph still evident in the languages, or pictographs still evident in the language that go back to biblical history. So asterisk, side note, people are gonna ask you about the flood in ancient Chinese tradition. Okay, so um, Mike, if, if we were to attempt to resist socialism, um, communism, a sort of uh, get rid of God and replace it with the state ideology, if, if we wanted to resist all of that here, but then find ourselves in a socialist or totalitarian state, how, 
how should a Christian live? Is it impossible to be a faithful Christian in a totalitarian state? Not at all. Um, you think about the apostles during the Roman times. Um, I think that's very similar, facing great oppression, but yet they were faithful. One of the amazing facts about the first 50 years of communism in China was in 1949, it was estimated about 5 million uh, Chinese were Christians. So that's after perhaps 150 years of evangelism by um, foreign missionaries, especially those in the US and from, from, the UK, uh, from the UK. So 5 million Christians in 1949, all the missionaries were kicked out of China and so there was, this, there was great fear that that was the end of the Christian church in China. But God has an amazing plan. All those five million Christians, they all went underground. They continue worshiping. They continue preaching the word of God. And there's some estimates that by 1999, so 50 years later, there's 50 million Christians in China. Imagine that. How is it possible that under great persecution, particularly during the years 1965 to 1975, which was the Cultural Revolution. So during the Cultural Revolution, anything that is considered to be a tradition, so Confucianism, anything that's considered to be um, education, so all the teachers were persecuted, sent to the countryside, all the schools were shut down, Anything that's foreign were persecuted. So if you have any foreign connections to the outside world, let's say you have a relative, right? You are persecuted. Foreign religion, which is, you know, what is Christianity is considered to be foreign. So if you're a Christian, if you're found with a Bible, right, you're put in jail, your Bible is con uh, confiscated, you are labeled as a, uh, a black sheep, so-called, which means that your kids can't go to school, you can't get the job that you want, and then if, you, if this rationing, you're the last one to get what's left over. Um, and during that time, I would say most of the Christian leaders have spent time in jail, persecution, uh, being publicly displayed and humiliated, being publicly beaten up, but yet during that time, the Christian faith grew. And I think we're all familiar with that concept in the Bible that persecution purifies the faith. And often it's through persecution that God grows the body of Christ. And that's exactly what happened in China. You didn't remain in China. 1984, you found yourself in Boston. So next slide, we'll locate ourselves here. So in 1984, our family immigrated to Boston. So it was quite a shock going from a uh, tiny village where there's no running water, no uh, sewage system. I remember growing up going to um, the well to get water for my family every day. That's my chore. Um, and then every day after school, I had to go to the mountains to get firewood um, so the family can use the firewood to cook. So for any Young kids here, when your mom asks you to do chores, please don't complain. <laughs> and then 1984, we got, I got plopped down in, in Boston. And, um, and so we immigrated because of family unification. Um, we, we moved with literally just two suitcases, right? not a US dollar in our pockets. And um, my parents, um, started working as laborers. My mom worked in a factory as a cleaner, and my dad worked in a restaurant initially also as a cleaner, and then he learned how to cook, and so he became a chef. And at the age of 13, to help the family with finances, I began working in my uncle's restaurant on the weekends. And so that's how I spent um, pretty much every weekend uh, from the age of 13 until 20, roughly 20. Um, I think those were good lessons for me. I think I learned the value of hard work. I think I learned how to uh, treasure what I have. Um, 
But there were also really hard times, primarily because of two factors. One is my parents had a very broken marriage. My father was verbally and physically abusive toward my mom. He was a very distant man. And I think it was because he lost his father when he was 10 years old. He didn't have a role model. He lived a hard life. And um, so looking back, I understand more um, why the way he was the way he was. But nonetheless, growing up, I didn't understand that. And so I had a very broken relationship with him. And I long for an intimate relationship with my father. In fact, when I was a teenager, I made it to be a goal that when I grow up, I'm going to be a really, really good father. At least I would try. Because I, I just desire his love. I desire his attention. And he was never able to give it. And one of the, the most significant events happened when I, when I was about 14 years old. I was graduating from middle school. So going from 10 years old, learning ABC, um, in a bilingual school system for a couple of years, and then graduating eighth grade, I was the top student in my class. I got almost you know, perfect scores in all my, my classes. And so I was nominated to be the top student and also to get the principal's award. The night before my graduation, my parents got into a really nasty fight. And at the age of 13, I was taller than my dad. I thought I was stronger. As my dad was being very abusive toward my mom, I stood up and I shoved my dad against the wall and I said, don't ever touch my mom. And that sent my dad into a rage. And he went to the kitchen, he took out a kitchen knife and threatened to kill all of us. And I don't know what would have happened if my landlord didn't come up uh, to the apartment to intervene. My mom then took my sister to my grandparents' house. Um, I, sm I somehow stayed at home. I was in fear of my life the whole day. The next day I went to school and it was the oddest feeling, just having my accomplishments celebrated in front of the whole graduating class. At the end of the ceremony, I had so many medals and, um, <clears throat> and trophies, the teacher gave me a garbage bag to hold them all to bring home. And that walk from school to home was the loneliest and saddest walk I ever had in my life. And, the, and that was the beginning of many years of severe depression where I had no sense of identity. I didn't know what love was. I had no affirmation. The love that I wanted for my father was not just not given, but it was just completely just yanked away and replaced it with just anger against him, just anger. And that's how I spent most of my later teenage years, just being angry, being lost, um, seeking affirmation in other things in life, whether it's friendship, relationships, uh, trying to do my best in school to achieve things so then I feel that I have a sense of value. Um. So you stayed in Boston and went to college. Uh, what did you study? I was a biology and chemistry major with a minor in East Asian studies. And then what did you do from there? I was also a pre-medical student. I knew that I wanted to become a physician in high school, um, but not because I love helping people or knew a lot about medicine, but I thought that being a doctor gave me status and significance and recognition. So at the end of four years in college, I realized I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what I wanted to do in medicine. And for me, going to medical school and becoming a doctor just wasn't, wasn't, wasn't a goal that was enough for me. 
So I made the decision not to go to medical school, not to apply, and instead I joined the Peace Corps and went to South Africa, where I lived and worked for two and a half years in a rural village. Um, and it was one of the most formative years of my life. I had amazing friendships that I made there. Um, and by nature, I'm a very shy and introverted person. So for me to be in a foreign land, learning a new language, being looked at as a, um, as a leader in the community, coming in and helping with community development, education development, a specialist in teaching math, science, and English. I was 23 years old at that time. But it challenged me. It challenged me to um, just come, up, come out of the shell and to speak with more confidence, to engage with people. Um, and, and it was fantastic. I had two of the best years of my life. And it did help me for a time in terms of dealing with this sense of emptiness and despair that I've been experiencing since the age of 13. Um, and for a time, it did fulfill what I was looking for in terms of affirmation. It felt good to be recognized. And I did some good things in the, in the village. But that feeling of satisfaction was very short-lived. And so I came back to the US and again, just felt rudderless. Didn't know what to do with my life. Um, so then I went to grad school, at the same time applied for a medical school. And where did that take you? So grad school took me to New York. I was enrolled in a master program in public health and was there for a year and a half in New York. Okay. And when you finished that program, mm -hmm. uh, you found yourself in India. So it was actually in the middle of the program. After, about, after one year, I had, um, well, the summer between first and second year, I had the option of going overseas to do a summer internship to do some research. And I have multiple offers. Um, Pakistan, Vietnam, uh, Nepal, Bangladesh, um, India. India is my last choice, just like going to Africa is my last choice. Um, I want to go to Vietnam to work for Save the Children. Um, because I love working with children. And every single door closed um, about four weeks before summer started. And God just direct me, directed me and say, go to India. And so so there I went, and my only connection there was I met this doctor in a conference, and he seemed like a really nice guy, really gentle. We spoke for a little bit. I got his email. And when every other door closed, I emailed him and said, Dr. Thomas, uh, he's actually Indian. I need a summer internship, and I will come to your hospital and do anything. Just say yes. And he wrote back and said, yes, why don't you come? We'll figure out what you do when you come here. And so he picked me up in a, uh, a small city on the coast, um, east coast of India, in a city called Vishakhapatnam. And he picked me up in a Jeep, and it was late in the evening. We drove for hours and hours, just up the mountains, up the mountains, until we finally got to the hospital around midnight. He dropped me off in my room. I, barely slept. The next morning, I had breakfast with him. And then he said, hey, Mike, let's go to a morning meeting. I'd love to introduce you to the hospital staff. I said, great. So we went, a small conference room, maybe about 20 people, a few doctors, some nurses, other medical staff. And someone brought a guitar. And I said, that's a funny way to start a meeting. <laughs> then they began singing hymns. Now, I'm familiar with Christian hymns because I've been a church I've been to church a few times in my life up to that point. And then they started praying. And so in my mind, I was thinking, what kind of hospital is this? 
And then Dr. Thomas, seeing my, seeing my confusion, just leaned over and said, did I not tell you this is a Christian hospital? And we're all missionaries here. <laughs> and I said, oh. <laughs> but that was the start of a beautiful friendship. Dr. Thomas, um, he's a surgeon, and he just loved me. He loved me the way that I wanted my father to love me. He was a wise man. He was a gentle man. He took an interest in me and just asking me about my life. And <clears throat> he took me into a lot of his uh, surgery. So as a pre-medical student, that was like amazing. I get to scrub in with the surgeon and do surgeries with him. And, and I realized what he was doing, he wanted that time alone with me to talk with me. So in a two hour operation to remove a tumor, uh, that's two hours of talk time. So we talk about my childhood, my struggles in life, what I'm looking for in life. And then he began sharing his life with me. He, his father was a pastor who planted many churches in India. And he himself didn't want to be a pastor, but felt called to be a physician and to be in the missions field. And so he and two other classmates, once they finished medical school, went and started that, uh, the hospital there. And then he began slowly sharing the gospel with me, inviting me to his house for dinner. And then afterwards, we'll go up to his study where he will open the Bible and just going through scripture with me. And for the first time, I did not resist the gospel. I did, at least I did not resist listening to the gospel. I did not resist reading the Bible with another person. And I think what, well, God is the one who opened my heart. But the gospel was presented to me in a way, again, the gospel is so rich, it's so beautiful, it's so powerful, that there are many ways to present it as long as the core is there. And the way it was presented to me was, Mike, what you are looking for, even if you can reconcile with your father and he can love you the way that you want to be loved, that would not satisfy you. The only thing that would satisfy you, the only thing that would give you significance, value, purpose, is if you know the Heavenly Father. And the only way to the Heavenly Father is through Jesus Christ, through faith in Him, through faith in what He has done on the cross, through faith in who He is. And for the first time, that made sense to me. So at the end of my two months in India, I broke down. And I, in the middle of a hot Indian night, um, I felt peace for the first time in my life. And I felt love for the first time. And I felt the embrace of my Heavenly Father. And I became a follower of Christ. so thrilling to see God's sovereign hand moving you from place to place and putting you in this hospital, this internship with Dr. Thomas. Tell me about, or tell us about the, um, the people group. Uh, we may be familiar with sort of the caste system uh, from high caste Brahmins to untouchables. Where was this city? Where was this hospital? What were those people like? What was the situation? Why was he there? Uh, so, so Lamtaput is in the mountains of a state called Odisha. It used to be called Orissa. And Orissa is known to be a tribal state. So we're mostly familiar with the Hindu caste system, where the highest of the Brahmins, the priestly group, and then you have the, I guess, the, the royals, all the way down to the untouchables. The people living there are even below the untouchables because they were outside the Hindu caste. These are tribal people that live in the mountains, and they were 
12 tribal groups. One of the groups called the Bondo people are so primitive, and I use that word you know, carefully, that men still walk around with bows and arrows to hunt, and women mostly do gathering. Although I think nowadays they do some you know, domesticating of animals. And so Dr. Thomas and his two uh, Christian brothers, when they got to that area, they prayed and just felt clearly that God wants them to be there. The name of the hospital is called Asha Kiran, which means a ray of light. They felt God was calling them to be in a really dark spiritual place to be God's light for these people. So the hospital started with just a mud hut, or tent actually, and then a mud hut, and then a brick house, and then now actually a pretty large hospital that's capable of doing some pretty amazing surgeries. But that is not the main focus, that's just the platform. The main focus is using that platform to have linguists, to have biblical scholars come in, learn the language, develop a writing system for the language, then do Bible translation. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Mike, it's so fascinating thinking about a, a medical career for prestige, recognition, accolades. And that mission hospital seems like the farthest from any of those things. How, how did being involved there shape what you would do in the future in terms of pursuit of a medical career? I'm not sure. I think what I saw in that community was for the first time, so comparing that to the Peace Corps, and I met some amazing people in the Peace Corps, my fellow volunteers, but everyone has a personal agenda in terms of why they're doing it. And I would say a lot of people is for personal growth, which is fine. Others do it for something amazing in the CV for the next step in their career. And I have to confess, that was one of my motivations for doing that. But what I saw in Lamtaput was a group of Christians, local, they were all local Indian Christians. No Americans, no British, all 100% local believers. But felt called to the missions field. And so they do the same things medicine, dentistry, um, whatever technical skill you have to offer, but do it in a way that has a higher purpose. And I never experienced that before. And so it intrigued me, well, what is that higher purpose? Why, why for someone like Dr. Thomas, who is brilliant, he was one of the top graduates in the top medical school in India. He could have gotten a very wealthy, in a job as a private doctor. He could have gone to government. He could have been a professor. Right? All these things that has great worldly rewards. But yet he chose to be in that hospital, just ministering to people uh, physically, spiritually. And that for me was, I think, one of the things that opened my heart and mind to the gospel is this, what are these people living for? Um, it was clear to me that it is beyond this, is beyond this world. And of course, looking back, it is to, to be pleasing to God. It is for the glory of Christ. It is to save those who are lost. It's to give hope to those who are hopeless. If I'm following the narrative correctly, you went from India to China, is that right? So India, back to New York, uh, finished my last semester, and then had and then accepted to medical school, had a six month gap, uh, because I graduated in December, medical school starts in July, and my parents, my mom said, you should just find a real job, work for six months, make some money, because medical school is expensive. Of course, being a good son I am, I said, no mom. <laughs> I felt this heavy tug in my heart to go to China. Not only that, more specifically, is to go to China and work in a Christian orphanage. So I was six months into my 
walk with Christ, no idea about what it means to be a missionary or to be in the missions field, no idea that in the year, what, this is 2001, how would I even find a Christian organization that runs orphanages in communist China? But that's what God placed in my mind. And I, and I did. Well, God found such an organization for me. And so in January, I went to China. And also just um, a backstory too, the week before my departure, I had a massive um, abscess in my mouth, in my, one of my uh, teeth, and require oral surgery. The day before my departure, my face was still swollen. I was on antibiotics, and my mom again said, son, just delay your flight by two weeks, because you don't know the medical system in China. Right? This is a serious issue. And again, being a good son, I said, the son I am, I said, mom, no. And so I, I flew to China, and the third day I was in the orphanage, I met my wife, Olivia. And we've been married now for almost 20 years. There's a little more to that story. <laughs> Can you give me a pop? So uh, maybe just tell us how did Olivia end up there? Why was she still there when you got there? Uh, again, just remarking at God's providence in, uh, in bringing you two together. Um, Watching the clock as well. So Olivia was born and raised in China. She was a, uh, a college teacher when I met her. She became a Christian through an American missionary. So, and she became a Christian two years prior to my coming to faith. And it was through prayers. So she had a very good friend who was uh, an American missionary and both of them were single, so they began praying for each other. And, and Linda began praying for Olivia that she would meet a Chinese-American Christian. Now, in the midst of com living in communist China, why would she have that prayer if it's not given by God, right? And so that's how Linda prayed for Olivia. And so she, Olivia went to an underground church uh, pastored by an amazing, amazing uh, Christian. Um, and, and so she, uh, she came to the orphanage to volunteer for two weeks because the, the pastor knew those American missionaries and they were looking for someone who can do translation, interpretation uh, during the time when their interpreter uh, quit, actually. And so Olivia said, sure, I'll go for two weeks. And that's we met. So I wouldn't want to endorse dishonoring or disobeying mom when she says, you've got an abscess, don't go to China. And you said, forget you, mom, I'm going anywhere. But um, we know that God can use evil for good. <laughs> so, well, I'm not endorsing this gut feeling either. I think sometimes in life, um, certain doors open or certain um, ideas come to your mind, and you always want to be wise, well, seeking wise counsel, talking to your pastor, uh, being in God's word, and praying uh, to see if this is coming from the Lord. Of course, I was such a young Christian at that time, I, didn't, I wasn't equipped to think biblically. I just had this strong urge, and I felt convicted that it was coming from God. And this is just a great biblical truth related to God's providence. A man plans his steps and the Lord directs his path. And we don't look forward into those things thinking, what, what is God saying? Where is he going to take me? But we can look back and just praise him. Look where he's brought me. And uh, really remarkable. So from China then, you um, were in Massachusetts. Is that right? Yes. Went back to Massachusetts for medical school. And then afterwards was in Connecticut for my internal medicine residency training. Okay, and why did you pick internal medicine? I thought it was the most um, intellectual of all the fields. 
because it's about problem solving and it's also very broad, which means that you have to have a vast knowledge about cardiology, kidney diseases, um, lung diseases, you know, blood disorders, and also allows me to choose a subspecialty later if I want to, and I did. Okay, and then your residency was in? Internal medicine. Internal and medicine, in was that in Connecticut? Fellowship. Okay. Yeah, so fellowship, I chose to become an oncologist. And that took you to San Francisco? San Francisco, that's okay. right. So, new slide, new stage. Why did, what is oncology? Why did you pick oncology? I didn't pick oncology initially. I thought about becoming a cardiologist because I'm a very mechanical thinker. And so the heart, the pump, pressure, electricity makes a lot of sense to me. But I thought, well, what kind of people do I work with every day? Well, you work with cardiologists, and, and well, what kind of people are cardiologists? And this is totally stereotyping. They tend to be a little bit arrogant, um, not the best, best side manners, not the warmest people. And I just thought to myself, would I be happy coming to work every day and these are my colleagues? And the answer was no. I chose oncology because of a very um, significant experience that happened in my second year in residency. I was taking care of a, a young Ukrainian woman and she had a type of cancer called sarcoma. It was very advanced. There wasn't anything that we could do for her. She was in the hospital for two weeks and she was dying. And I found out that I, actually, I love caring for patients who are dying because there's a lot of opportunities for not just the medical care, but the emotional care, the psychosocial care, and the spiritual care. I took care of her for two weeks. I was broken hearted. My heart was broken that she died at the end. Her mom was devastated. What I experienced during that time was I really wanted to share the gospel with her. I was still, I can't say I was a young Christian, but I would say I wasn't a mature Christian. And I had a lot of fear. I was a junior resident working in a large academic center. I have fellows above me. I have attending physicians above me. And I was really afraid of being caught sharing the gospel with a patient. So while I provided good care for her, at the end, looking back, I don't remember sharing the gospel with her. And she died. And I was guilt-ridden for a long time. And then because of that experience, I begin to think more about oncology as a field because it is so natural to be an oncologist and ask you, well, how are you doing? Most patients will assume, well, he's asking, am I having pain? Am I having nausea? How's the chemotherapy going? Which is all good. And then I ask them, well, how, you been, how have you been dealing with your cancer? And most people will say, assume that is a, well, how, how am I doing emotionally? And we say, yeah, I've been doing okay. How are you doing socially? How's everyone at home? How's your wife? How's your husband? How are your kids? Right. And then the next question, now you'd be surprised on how few doctors even ask that question. How are you doing? How's your family doing? How are your kids doing? Right. But the next question, how are you doing spiritually? In all my years in training, I have never heard this question being asked. But as oncologists, I realized that it is a golden opportunity to ask a person, how are you doing spiritually? Because I guarantee you, even the atheist, think about this question. Even the strongest atheist, a gay man in San Francisco, have thought about this question, is there life after death? What am I made of besides flesh and bones? And 
I will find out later that by asking that question, it actually draws me closer to the patients. I've, had not, I've not had one patient who feels offended by that question, or re that one patient who rejected to engage in it. He said, Dr. Lee, I'm an atheist. I believe that we just flesh and bones. When we die, we become dust, and that's the end of the story. I appreciate asking the question, but let's not engage in that question. And that's fine. But almost everyone else, when I ask that question, it just leads to beautiful conversations about fear, about hope, about their struggles. And, and that leads to amazing conversations about Jesus Christ. So, <clears throat> Mike, you're, you're very wonderful public speaker. You love public speaking. You just love standing up in front of people and talking. Um, what would you say to the ordinary Christians for whom starting a conversation is hard, for whom speaking to people about sensitive things, spiritual things, is a challenge? Well, your description of me is way off the, um, the mark. Um, <clears throat> well, that describes me in terms of fear, in terms of being uncomfortable. Um, it takes practice. I would say big picture is it is not about me. It is not me who's talking. It is God talking through me. It is God working through me to do what he wants to do. And I can offer some uh, examples of that. Um, I think what I learned over the past 10 years, especially of being an oncologist and being in a position to share the gospel either with colleagues, other physicians, uh, patients, family members, is number one, it is God who's at work. It is not me. Number two, the word of God has the power to save. So while apologetics is all good, nothing is more powerful and life transforming than opening the Bible and say, this is what God says. Number three, evangelism is the work of the Holy Spirit. Number four, prayers, prayers, prayers. Prayers move mountains. Prayers move people's heart and people's minds. So I'll, I'll give a few examples. Prayers. So in San Francisco, I had a uh, Cantonese-speaking man who had end-stage liver cancer. I never had a close relationship with him because his personality type is a little bit brash. And um, so I took care of him to the best of my ability until the cancer was too advanced to really provide any effective treatment. Now he uh, has been thinking about life and death. And so he contacted a local Chinese Christian cancer support group without knowing that I am one of the members of that group. <laughs> and so when he contacted them, um, my leader then called me up and said, hey, Mike, there's a patient um, that I think he would really need some, he would appreciate you know, spiritual care. Right? That's what we do, we provide spiritual care. And I said, sure. And then he gave me his name and I said, hmm, that name sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, it was my patient. So I call him up and say, hey, this is Dr. Lee. And as God would have it, I, I'm assigned to be your you know, spiritual support. And so I, it was a very busy couple of weeks for me. So finally, I found time to go visit him. When I went to see him, he was the totally changed man physically. He was um, lethargic. He was rigoring in fevers. It was hard to have a conversation with him. And, and I went to his house to see him. I made a house visit. And again, I just felt so guilt-written because why have I been so busy for the past week that I couldn't make the time to see him earlier? And then that weekend, so I, I saw him on a Friday, 
that weekend, I went away to a men's retreat uh, with some Christian brothers. And in my mind, I was thinking, well, by the time I come back, he'd probably be gone. He was, his son was in the process of moving him to hospice. I came back, I called his son. He said, yeah, my dad is still in hospice. I went to the hospice facility to see him. And he was, stand, he was just sitting right up. I was shocked. I walked in and he said, hey, Dr. Lee, how are you doing? I said, I'm doing fine. And I began sharing the gospel with him and we read some scripture to him. Um, and he professed faith in Christ. And he said, I've been, he said, he's been thinking about death for a long time. He knew there was life after death, but he didn't know what that was and how to get there. And so the gospel, my, the gospel presentation for him was uh, exactly along those lines. But what was amazing was in the middle of my conversation with him, there's an old woman who walked in and said, I'm sorry, excused herself and walked out. And then later on, after my patient uh, prayed with me to receive Christ, I walked to the lounge and I met that woman who turned out to be his sister. And I had a conversation and I have no idea how long she was standing at the door. Right? And then she said, you know, Dr. Lee, um, I heard what you said to my brother and my my heart started pounding. And then she said, I'm a Christian, and I've been praying for my brother for weeks now that God would give him more time so that he can hear the gospel. So with this man, it's nothing about what I did, but the faithful prayers of his sister, who's a believer, that God be so merciful to give him more time so that he can hear the gospel. He actually stayed in hospice for two weeks. He was getting stronger, getting better, so he went home. And he lived for another six months, and he attended church, and then he was baptized later, and then he went to be with the Lord. Um, so prayers, you never know right, how God will use your prayers to save someone. Mike, I'm going to get us to the last slide, uh, which is you're here in Arizona. Um, you're continuing to care for oncology patients, and you, you seem particularly drawn to terminal patients. That's not an avenue that most oncology doctors want to just devote their time to. Um, and yet, for the very reasons you just described, that's where you find yourself week after week. And uh, I just, you, you've got more stories than we could fill hours with but you've had opportunity to interact with Grace Bible Church people, um, find them randomly, uh, providentially, uh, in hospitals, and then um, with the Hmong people. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but. Um, so we've got five minutes. Tell whatever stories you want to tell us, um, and then I'll give some concluding remarks. I'll share the story of um, a family who's now attending GBC as well. I hope that's okay. Um, and this is the story of God's love and God seeking his people to redeem them so that they can be worshipers of the one true God. The one true God. I met this man in the hospital about nine months ago, Banner Ocotillo. And I was asked to see him because he was just diagnosed with stage four stomach cancer. I walked in the room, there was this very young man, he was 32 years old. He was visibly in pain, uncomfortable. On his, next to his bedside was his wife. And I, of course, went through all the medical stuff, did what I have to do as an oncologist, um, as his physician. I noticed, he's an Asian man, I noticed that uh, on his wrist were wristbands, there were some necklaces, white and red color, and I asked them, like, what is your ethnic origin? And they said, well, Hmong people. So Hmong people is a, a, a tribe that was originally from China, but has experienced centuries of persecution by Chinese Han people, and then they have then been migrating south to Vietnam, Laos, 
and Thailand. And so this couple's family is from Laos and they immigrated to the US after the Vietnam War when the communists were persecuting the Hmong people for helping the US in, in Vietnam. He said, well, Hmong people, and I know a bit about Hmong culture. I knew that these bracelets are for, to ward off evil spirits and for healing. And I know some of the practices with shamanism. And God placed in my heart to pray for this couple. And so on the very first day I met them, I was praying for them. He then went uh, cancer treatment, his cancer was stable at some time. He was in and out of the hospital. I took care of him. And then in October, he was quite sick in the hospital. And I remember you now this time walking into the hospital room and noticed that they were not wearing any of those necklaces and bracelets. And so again, once we get the medical business out of the way, I asked them, I have noticed that you guys are not wearing those anymore. And then his wife said, yeah, we've been doing a lot of thinking and praying and we are, we are seeking the one true God. That statement stuns me because that has been my prayer for them for the four months since I've known them is God, I pray to you that they would know the one true God so they would not worship ancestors they would not worship spirits that they don't know, but that they would know you as the one true God. And so the tear just started coming out of my eyes and I said, can I share with you? I've been praying for you guys for months. Can I share with you as a Christian who the one true God is? And so I shared the gospel with them. I read through some scripture with them and then had multiple opportunities to do that. And again, when he went home, I made a home visit. And just sat down with them, pray with them, um, and then look at them in the eyes, one, one of my visits, and say, what do you think about what I have told you? Right, what you heard so far? And he said, everything makes sense. And he said, do you believe? And, he said, and they said, yes. And he said, do you believe that Jesus is God that he died for you on the cross, that your sins are forgiven, so that you are reconciled to the one true God, and that you have eternal life with him. And both of them said yes. Now, the, the husband has since uh, passed on to be with the Lord, but God is so good and so faithful that uh, his family now worships with us, and... Uh, Mike, thank you. Our, our time is gone. You've got sort of a tip of an iceberg here. Um, but I think what I want to highlight as we close, and if I could have titled this lecture differently than I did, I, I would t title it uh, An Interview with an Ordinary Christian and an Unlikely Evangelist. Uh, Mike would call himself unlikely. Shy, don't like talking to people. And, and yet, moment by moment, a man whose life is devoted to the Lord, who sees his role as an ambassador for Christ on this earth, pray for people. And then wherever you find yourself, whatever your area of expertise, uh, wh whatever your daily occupation, that's the world God has placed you in and make use of it for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I hope that's an encouragement to you for all of us to strive to live for the reason that we're still breathing on this earth as those who know God in a fallen world. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for saving Mike and Olivia. Thank you for bringing them to this body to be a, a regular encouragement. Uh, to, to those in our body who have uh, suffered physically and, and met Mike as an oncologist, and for all of us who have heard your testimony or his testimony of your grace in his life, to, to think again about what it meant for us to be saved from our slavery to sin and from your wrath and to be ushered into love, acceptance, uh, adoption, eternal life, and then this great task of representing you and your glorious truths while you give us breath. We pray to do so all for your glory, in Jesus' name, amen.
We'll regather in a few minutes for main service. Thank you. Thank you, Mike.